The future of graphics technology is being architected before our eyes, with a couple of notable technical exceptions. We've had a generation where the worth of a new graphics card has been defined entirely by the amount of frames per second it offers. But as we move on to the next generation, the direction of travel is looking pretty straightforward. Ray tracing is here for Nvidia. It's coming to AMD and Intel GPUs, and it's already being flagged up by both Microsoft and Sony for the PS5 and Xbox Series X. Machine learning features, again, Nvidia has them. And generally, it hasn't quite had the same level of exposure as RT, but expects some announcements at some point. Put it this way, I don't think Microsoft would have developed the direct ML API if only Nvidia was on board for using it. So what's the entry level for a rig supporting all of these features in the here and now? Well, I expect up what I'd consider to be a pretty compelling PC that will cover the bases here. CPU-wise, for a good all-round experience, I'm using a Ryzen 5 3600 paired with 16 gigs of 3200 MHz DDR4. Not the cheapest option in terms of CPU and RAM, but certainly a good option when balanced with the GPU I'm concentrating on for this video, the RTX 2060 KO from EVGA. Acted as something of a spoiler when AMD released its RX 5600 XT, offering broadly equivalent performance, plus all the tensor cores and RT cores that should in theory deliver some level of future-proofing for the next era of games. That's really what this video is about. You've seen the RTX 2060 KO reviews already, I'm sure, and if you haven't, they don't come much better than Steve's over at Gamers Nexus. But for this one, I'm going to concentrate more on the ray tracing side of things. Whenever I talk about the RTX 2060 on Twitter, somebody usually pipes up to say it's not good enough to support RT properly while still giving good performance when they likely haven't tested it at all. And you know, to be fair, while I have tested it, I think there are still gaps in my knowledge and looking at the KO is a good opportunity to address that. On top of that, RTX 2060 is an important product. In the PC space at least, NVIDIA has defined this as the baseline for RT performance, and I strongly suspect that this baseline will persist into the upcoming Ampere era, the next generation NVIDIA GPU. The performance level will just become cheaper. So what can you do, ray tracing wise with a 2060? Now this EVGA KO model, well, the firm happily sampled me with one, and it is indeed a fascinating piece of kit doesn't quite have the premium finish overall that you'll find with the reference Founders Edition. Plastic shroud for starters, but you do get a nice metal backplate. Clearly a smaller card than the Founders though, but you do get the sense that there are cutbacks and they are noticeable. It's noticeably louder, for example, than the Founders under load. And if you take a look at the back, you'll see that you lose the USB-C virtual link functionality. Pop open the shroud and the thermal assembly is somewhat basic for this level of card and the power delivery system is limited too. But yes, similar to other review samples out there, this is indeed a TU-104 based processor, the same silicon that powers the 2070 Super and 2080, but with its CUDA core pruned back to match the 2060, the original TU-106 model. This doesn't affect other parts of the design, so yeah, you'll still only need one 8-pin power input. The use of the larger TU-104 does mean that the KO does exhibit some extraordinary render power in Blender, as gamers Nexus mentioned a while back. Now, this isn't really my thing, so let's not look at this as any kind of definitive test, but on the flip side, if even I can see a big uptick in performance, obviously there's something to this. I downloaded Blender, chose the CUDA rendering path, and gave a couple of examples a go. Blasting through the pretty basic BMW render, KO is faster than the founders, but you only shave off around 4% of the render time. Moving on to this more challenging demo, that time saving increases to 19%, so clearly there is something to this. What that actually is remains to be seen. I checked in with EVGA, who seem none the wiser about why Blender performs like this, and it's pretty clear that Nvidia has nothing further to add. Uh, but the latest drivers still work just as Gamers Nexus said it would, when Nvidia could easily patch this out. But if you're looking for any kind of further advantage from the KO, specifically in gaming, well, you're in for a disappointment. I've noticed that some benchmarks in the reviews out there give the KO a slight advantage over the Founders Edition, you know, in line with the kind of meager improvements you may see from a factory overclock. However, in lining up my KO results, 
against founders results, frame rates and frame times align almost perfectly. And uh, this happened in pretty much every game I tested. As usual for a card of this class I used 1440p resolution for my tests. And yeah, I'm not really going to dwell too much on this because essentially while the technological makeup at the chip level may be very, very different with the KO, the output results are exactly what's being marketed by EVGA. You're getting 2060 performance for a card with a 2060 name. Overclocking, well, this is one area where the KO apparently has a disadvantage. Pop into MSI Afterburner and you can tweak core clock, memory frequency, temperature limits and fan speeds as per normal but the all-important power slider can't be adjusted. You can't feed more power into the card, so by extension, you should expect the limits of overclocking to be somewhat more severe than on a standard RTX 2060. Well, the thing is, I could dial in an extra 120 MHz of core frequency and push the GDDR6 memory up with a 500 MHz offset. And you know what? That's typically what I do when I overclock my Founders 2060. And I found that I gained around 5% of additional performance on the KO by doing this. And I also noted that despite the power limitation, for the most part, I was getting that extra frequency. My takeaway here, you may have fewer overclocking options with the RTX 2060 KO, but realistically, you're not gonna be losing that much in the way of additional performance. But what you are losing is a bit of peace and quiet. KO is already louder than the Founders Edition and now it's even louder. Performance wise though, a lower overclock limit doesn't translate into a palpably noticeably slower card and if that's the price of delivering a cheaper 2060, it's fine by me. But what can we expect performance wise from the 2060 in the field of raid facing? It's a bit of a difficult one this because it's a kind of moving target of sorts. Nvidia received a lot of heat from users back in the day because raid facing support wasn't plentiful or super optimal out of the gate. However, there has been a clear trajectory of improvement over the months. Well, I've already looked at Battlefield 5 RT performance on 2060 back in the day, but it's the same now as it was then. This time I'm showing you what happens when frame rate is unlocked. Keep your plus 120, plus 500 overclock in place as I've done with all of the RT testing here keep Battlefield 5 on Ultra, swap textures down to high and implement medium level DXR. For the vast majority of gameplay, you'll get 1080p at 60 frames per second or higher and it looks pretty sweet. I should note here that in all of our RT testing here, we're moving out of traditional benchmarking territory and I'm using the Ryzen 5 CPU here, not the overclocked 8700K we typically use. So this is the actual output of what I'd consider to be a pretty balanced rig for the 2060, whether you're running with ray tracing on or off. Another demanding first gen game for ray tracing, Shadow the Tomb Raider. Right, so I'm going to challenge established wisdom here that says that the shadow only implementation used by Nixis is somehow less intensive for ray tracing wise. Truth is that the lower quality settings embellish the existing shadow maps with some RT loveliness, but on Ultra, we're full on with ray tracing and you do get some rather impressive results. It's also the case that the biggest hits to performance aren't shown at all in the benchmark sequences. Actual gameplay, as you can see, shows a lot of variance and it seems that ultra level DXR struggles on foliage. Well, these leaves, this type of leaves specifically, I'm using a mixture of high settings, a couple of normals for depth of field and level of detail, pretty much on par with uh, Xbox One X, but I am banking that towards Ultra DXR rendering. So the reality is that in both Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Battlefield 5, RT is particularly impactful to frame rate and can cause real issues even at 1080p. So that's enough to discount the 2060 as a viable RT card, right? I mean, $300 and you can't sustain 1080p60. What's the point? Well, here we are in Metro Exodus with its stunning raid face global illumination. And funny thing here, the game seems to run a bit slower than I recall with more dips beneath 60 frames per second. But yeah, we're still able to run at high here with a decent performance level overall. And those dips wouldn't really be a concern if you're running on an adaptive sync display. Performance here isn't quite as high as I'd like. I mean, essentially we're looking at console quality here with uh, Ray Trace Global Illumination running on top. But yeah, there are some further options here and I still think that this is an absolutely stunning example of what hardware accelerated ray tracing can bring to the table. 
Metro, pretty amazing all around actually. But yeah, there are two points I want to make about these titles that I've tested so far and their respective performance levels. First of all, clearly, the three of them are first generation efforts. They are bolt-on additions to games that were already in development based on very different rendering priorities. Outside of RT, all of these games are well optimized, built to specific rendering budgets, but because ray tracing is an added extra, it can have unforeseen impacts on performance in worst case scenarios. Secondly, I've not talked about DLSS, the second part of the equation, machine learning based upscaling, because while these games all support it, as well as ray tracing, implementation has been variable. But make no mistake, I kicked off this video by saying that ray tracing and machine learning features are key to the future of graphics technology. And it is going to happen. In fact, it's happening now. After years of a PC graphics card's worth being defined by how many frames it can pump out at any given resolution, technology is evolving and our attitudes need to shift in step. Temporal supersampling on the software side is one thing. Machine learning based upscaling will be another. I mean, the results with Wolfenstein Youngblood speak for themselves. I'm not going to do too much on this one because Alex has already covered off the basics, but suffice to say that the DLSS in this title is so good, you'd kind of be nuts not to use it. Helps to mitigate the cost of ray tracing, but even if you don't want to use RT, it allows the 2060 to comfortably run the game at an impressive quality level north of 60 frames per second at 4K. Well, a machine learning approximation of 4K, of course, but the fact is it's really close to the presentation delivered by native rendering. Now, going back to Battlefield 1, Metro Exodus or Shadow of the Tomb Raider, well, if you have a 2060, give DLSS a go. You might like it. You might even get a pretty decent 1440 experience. But DLSS 2.0, the latest iteration of the tech, is where I'm more convinced that this technology has legs, that it's ready in a crucial time of technological transition. Image quality is drastically improved from those first gen efforts. It works at any resolution and internal resolution scaling doesn't alter depending on the RTX GPU you're using. A bit of an issue with earlier DLSS tech. And well, even at 1080p, it can produce great results, remarkably, from a 540p base image. Now we need to see more titles, more implementations, but Wolfenstein Youngblood looks great and so does Deliver Us the Moon, both based on that 2.0 technology. But what I really, really want to see is support for 2.0 backported into prior titles like Remedies Control. What you get with this one right now has been referred to as DLSS 1.9, a transitionary version of the tech based entirely on the CUDA cores. Shader only then, but still pretty impressive. So here in Control, I'm at native 1080p resolution and I'm using RT at the medium settings, which emphasizes reflections. By and large, you can see what the frame rate's like here and it's fine, I guess. If I was playing on an adaptive sync display, perceptual quality would be great. But remember that even in the best RT supported games, it is a bolt on feature. And you do get sections like this where frame rate can buckle badly. Now, you might consider this a deal breaker, but with DLSS enabled from a 720p internal resolution, you still get a decent looking image as it's upscaled back up to 1080p. Performance, pretty much 60 frames per second or higher. And you know what? That doesn't actually tell the full story because DLSS has given me so much extra performance here, I can actually run the entire range of RT features while maintaining. 60 frames per second. And that's kind of why I really want to see DLSS 2.0 engineered back into control because the 1.9 results are pretty sweet, but we'd get much better image quality and even more performance. The point is though, that the perception out there is that the 2060 isn't up to the task of showing RT features at their best. And you know what? Based on a lot of first gen titles, I get that. But the fact is with a 2060, I can sample the entire RT feature set. And you know what? In fact, I can use DLSS to give a 4K output with all of the RT features enabled and I'm still at Xbox One X performance or better. Food for thought. In fact, let's take a look at some image quality comparisons. A one-to-one -one pixel map here in this clip, the X rendering at native 1440p, DLSS 1.9 upscaling from 1080p. Well, I think edge treatment is probably more refined on X with fewer artifacts, but the DLSS image, I think it looks cleaner. Truth is, when control looks this good, I'd happily play on either, but the fact is that with RTX 2060 and the OC in place, 
I've just about enough rendering power to play out at 4K30 with the entire suite of ray tracing features enabled. So here's the wrap up, machine learning, ray tracing, RTX 2060 supports them and you get that package of features for just a small premium over cards that do not offer them. I think it's worth it, but I'll be honest here, if I were buying today, I'd try to find the extra money for a 2070 or 2060 Super. One thing that I noticed is that both Wolfenstein and Battlefield 5 grumble over only having 6 gigs of RAM. And more generally, the more RAM you have, the better. The extra performance in going up to the next level is also palpable. But hey, so is the price you have to pay. Truth is though, that as we approach a key transition point in gaming technology, there's a pretty good argument to stay put for now with the kit you have and to see what technology arrives in and around uh, the new next generation consoles. I mean, straight away, if Xbox and PS5 turn up with CPU power equivalent to Ryzen 7 3700X, eight cores, 16 threads, then there's a good chance our Ryzen 5 3600 might start to come up a little short, even if it's a brilliant price versus performance champion in the here and now. But with that said, on the graphics side, if the RTX 2060 defines the baseline in terms of performance for next-gen graphics features, you can still get a great experience. And I hope this video has given you some idea of what the 2060 can actually do when those new features are being used and we've done some tuning to accommodate the power level. But I think the biggest takeaway is that this is still an emerging technology. Games built from the ground up with RT in mind stand to benefit a lot more than games where RT features have been bolted on, which is pretty much all of them at the moment. Now you might say that this situation is years away and you might be right. However, I interviewed 4A Games, creators of Metro Exodus, and I asked them for their reaction to the publicly revealed aspects of the next-gen console specs. And their response, they're all in on ray tracing. And that says to me that RT must, by extension, be a pretty core cool part of the next-gen console architecture, perhaps more so than we thought. They wouldn't architect a new game engine around ray tracing in a world where consoles define the baseline. And if the consoles aren't up to it, they wouldn't build their engine around it. Anyway, that's all from me for now, which means it's time for me to ask you to like the video if indeed you liked it to subscribe if you haven't already and to use your finger, mouse or trackpad to activate the bell icon there. Doing so invokes the godlike power of instant notifications whenever Digital Foundry posts a new video. And as always, shout out for the DF Patreon. By supporting the Digital Foundry team with a small contribution every month, you can directly support the kind of in-depth work we do and at the same time get source file downloads of everything we do, free from the compression issues that plague a lot of YouTube content. That's all from me for now. Thanks for watching and indeed supporting Digital Foundry.